Hi everybody, welcome to The Verdigree Table. I'm Ryan Doyle, and in this series, we're diving into Tales from the Yawning Portal to do some Dungeon Master preparation for the Forge of Fury. It is a great adventure with some really cool ideas inside, and I'm gonna help you get ready to run it and have an awesome time doing it. These videos are intended for Dungeon Masters. If you're going to be a player in this module, you're gonna get spoilers that will decrease everyone's fun at the table, including your own, so maybe come back after you finish the adventure so you can see all the cool stuff your dungeon master did to customize things for your group and maybe get a sense of how you might run it yourself one day. The original Forge of Fury came out for third edition and was intended as a follow-up to the Sunless Citadel. It is definitely its own thing though and not a sequel, so you don't have to start with that to run this. Also, if you did run the Sunless Citadel first and you're hoping for the adventures to be meaningfully connected, you're going to be disappointed or you're going to go have to do some work to build those connections in yourself, which is totally doable, but I don't think it's it's necessary. A lot of the officially published adventures and some long-running actual play shows out there kind of generate this perceived assumption that the Dungeon Master has to craft an epic storyline that stretches from level 1 through 20, or at least what, 1 through 12 or 14, uh, constantly building up the stakes and the drama until the big reveal at the very end just ties everything up in a great big bow. Uh, I think some people need to hear that it is okay to expect to play and run a much more episodic game. Your grand plan for what's going to happen in like a hundred sessions might be amazing, but it also might lead to heartbreak and feelings of failure when you only play, you know, a dozen times or so with this particular group before real life interjects and things change. Also, if you get too far ahead of yourself, it might take some of the shine off of what you're doing now and will waste your precious resource of prep time that should be used on what's coming next game session, not next year. Plus, it can lead to the worst kind of railroading. So let's just focus in on the next couple of levels, three to five specifically, and get down to the Forge of Fury. One thing this adventure does really well that we can learn from is it takes an overarching idea but injects a lot of variety and distinction between even within the levels. We're exploring the lost dwarven stronghold of Kunjakar, where Durgadin the Black led his people after a great defeat and forged some pretty sweet weapons to exact his revenge on the orcs who drove them here. That didn't work out though, and eventually the orcs took this place as well and killed off the remaining dwarves. Now, there's five levels of the dungeon, with the orcs controlling the very upper floor and the most obvious entrances, then troglodytes are in the middle, and Duergar, Duergar, however you want to say it, have recently relit Durgadin's forge in the haunted foundry level. So that's three. Uh, the other two are much smaller than those little offshoots and contain monsters that are probably going to kill somebody down here. A uh, roper and a young black dragon. This place is deadly, though a dungeon master does have some control over how deadly they want it to be, and we're going to circle back to that in a sec. We get the town of Blazingdell in a little plot, but it's so basic by design, you could merge it with Oakhurst or Phandalin, Seacomber, anywhere at Realton. If you do want to build in more continuity into your game, having a hometown or a home base can do a lot of that work. And you can show the impact of your players' actions there. It can also be nice to have a single starting town if you end up running for multiple groups. If you are bringing a lot of variety in the experience and the culture of the different places the party is visiting, awesome. Do it up. But if it is one bog standard fantasy town after another just to create a pretty flat sense that the story is going somewhere, which to be honest is a lot of what we get in published content, then to my mind you might as well just stay in one place and show progress there by having it grow and prosper or you know get destroyed. It gives the player characters some roots and a place to care about and the opportunity to develop lasting relationships with some NPCs. To start Forge of Fury in my home game I had the orcs take a well-loved NPC from the hometown uh, prisoner and made it into a rescue mission. 
The party successfully liberated their friend and sent her up the chimney with a potion of climbing, then nearly got wiped out. I've been rolling in the open, so I had willingly given up some of my power to throttle danger in the moment. And no lie, a natural 20 on a death saving throw saved the lives of at least two characters, including my wife's. And maybe prevented a full total party kill. Our heroes managed to escape, but by the time they'd limped back to town, the orcs had followed their tracks and burned down the tavern that was sort of their home base. Don't be afraid to rip your game world up and do some damage. You can always show it getting rebuilt and it can make things personal for the PCs. Show them that what they do matters. You better believe my players rounded up a posse and went right back to the Stone Tooth. I think that story shows the potential power of staying in one place instead of bouncing around, but it also shows the value of one of the most important parts of DM prep to consider before we begin an adventure. If you've watched me do Dungeon Master prep for Lost Mine of Fandelver or Son of the Citadel, you know how I feel about plot hooks for anything that is going to be run for more than a couple sessions. The ones we get here have some nice little details going for them, but don't feel super compelling, at least to me. We get three. Here's a map. Maybe there's some treasure and money. Here's some money. Go explore that place and make a map and find the treasure. Uh, here's some money. Go kill orcs. Towards the end of the last video, talking about the Tower of Rydal, the exceedingly clever, I gave a set of examples of how you could just plant a ton of lore drops and like signposts pointing at the Forge of Fury and kind of compensate for quality with quantity. And that will likely get them there and is maybe enough to keep them there if you do it right. But I put a little bit of thought into trying to get your players to have a good reason to keep on keeping on until the very end. You've been through some adventuring with these characters already, right? Think about if you can tie in some backstory details. If you've got a dwarf in your party, you're set. If you have martial classes, maybe talk up the power of Durgadin's blades and up how magic those weapons actually are when they finally get their hands on them. Maybe the cleric's god or the warlock's patron or somebody's relative can provide some motivation that's more personal. Maybe that motivation is just, you know, get that gold, get that treasure, but there's a specific reason, like the fantasy bank is going to take the family farm or something. There's also this very, like, thinly sketched out idea of another expedition to Kundrakar that failed. Maybe someone important to a PC was on that mission. The main reason the hooks we get in most adventures are so generic is that the designers don't know what's going on at your table, but you do. So take the little bit of extra time to think about how to customize things to get your specific characters and players to care. All right, before I take you beat by beat through this place so you feel prepared and confident to run this with your friends or your family, we're going to zoom out and take the 50,000 foot view, or rather we're going to take the, the cross section side view and think about how dangerous we really want this place to be. Because another th little thing my uh, story there demonstrated is that this place is definitely dangerous. As written, a player character or multiple player characters may very likely die. No, it's not a foregone conclusion and clever play and a little bit of luck will get everybody through this in one piece. But these older adventures are from an era where the game was more deadly. The three E ones in this book, less so than the even older ones, but still deadly compared to most of the stuff being put out today. Now that deadliness is a feature, not a bug, and I'm not here telling you that you've got to do anything to fix it. Death is a big part of D&D, &D, and we are going to remember the characters who have fallen and the locations that claimed them for years to come in a way that makes the experience incredibly special that almost no other game or storytelling medium can touch. So I say you can absolutely run this place as is. If you really want to lean into it, you can do what I did and roll in the open, fudge nothing, let the players know this is the realness and they better be careful because easy mode is over. A lot of players come in expecting their characters to, to make it through and live to finish their story. It's good to control expectations and put a little bit of the fear into them if you are not going to change things, even if you are. 
Ultimately, it is up to you and what you think is best for your table. I will say that my group remembers the time they almost got wiped out in the mountain door level of Kunjakar way more vividly than the dozens of places they cleared out with ease. So keep that in mind when you consider adjusting the danger levels. The biggest threats in here are threefold. The Roper in the Sinkhole, Night Scale in the Black Lake, maybe obviously. Honorable mention goes to the Succubus, but the most dangerous thing in here is something you might overlook at first, the water that is all over this place. So if you want to adjust the deadliness of the Roper, the first thing you could do is make its tendrils way easier to hit. That's what I did. It just feels right to me anyway. I'll buy that the main body has an AC of 20 because it's basically made of stone, right? But in my game, the tendrils are more vulnerable if targeted specifically. So maybe an AC of like 15 or 16. It doesn't touch the Roper's hit points to take them out and they grow back the next round. So it doesn't feel too cheap to me. Now, the method that the book uses to avoid a full TPK here is by stating that the Roper will only eat one character because then it will be full. Crazy, but fun. Another thing to maybe consider, though in the 5e Monster Manual, this thing has no languages. In 3rd edition, it was talking. In the original module, it says something like, thank goodness, I was getting really tired of fish before it tries to eat a player character, which is fun, but it also opens up the door for negotiations. Here, take all of our rations and we'll bring you some dead troglodytes and let us live. In the original, there's also like a note in the margins that says, hey, this thing is way more overpowered compared to the party. So if you think your players will just attack it, maybe cut this part out entirely. So that's also an option. If you're really afraid of this thing, cut it out and the players won't miss it. I'll put a link down below to the original PDF. It's on the DMs Guild. I'm not recommending that you pick it up if you're running the 5e version, but it's there if you want it, and it is pretty reasonable if you feel like checking it out. I think it's good to consider what you'll do with the Roper ahead of time, if anything. You will likely have a few sessions before anybody reaches the sinkhole, but there's a slim chance that they, they can blaze a path right for it, so be ready. They also may skip that section entirely too, it's kind of optional. You'll find out and have fun doing it. That's what keeps it a game. I'm trying to give you options, not make you worried. And on that note, I honestly don't think you should worry about adjusting the dragon. They've gained more XP by the time they find it, and it is the final boss here, after all. If adventurers want to attack a dragon in its lair, even a young one, it is your duty as a dungeon master to go all out and make it dangerous. We'll get more into Night Scale at the end of this series. For now, let's talk about the water. There are a bunch of places in here where the PCs can get swept up in fast flowing water, go over a waterfall or into a chasm, take a tremendous amount of falling damage, and then drown if the drop didn't kill them. There is a great animated spellbook episode about this very thing happening in this very dungeon. I'll put a link in the description down below and at the end of this one probably if you want to check it out. I love that channel. It's a lot of fun. Enjoy it if you don't know about it. On page 51, there is a block on how to run the water and it's pretty good. The key takeaway is multiple checks. It's not just, oh, you stepped on the slippery blank and you're dead. You have to fail several fairly easy rolls before you get got. And I'd let the other players try to help too if they can think of reasonable ways to assist. One change I am going to recommend you at least consider in here is reversing the way the water flows. It's not really a big deal and it might never come up, but as written, the water here ultimately pops out in a non-specific location on a hillside five miles to the west. I would actually reverse the flow and have it moving deeper and deeper into the dungeon, flowing through the Black Lake and out into the Dark Mirror at the end. I also rearrange things a little bit to have the water in 16 or 17 be directly under the chasm in 3. This will probably all make more sense as we go through everything in this series, but the idea is if a character 
falls, they end up further into the dungeon where we might discover them, whether they are alive or dead. Before anything like that happens or is avoided, though, our heroes are going to have to find their way inside of this place. This module does an excellent job of providing different access points. Technically, there's four, but unless you're running a party of more folk or something, nobody's going through the dark mirror and jumping straight to the dragon. So focus in on the other three. There is a clear path leading up to the mountain door, so the players are probably going to attempt a frontal assault on a heavily fortified position before realizing maybe that might not be the greatest idea. There is that billowing spire of smoke just beckoning them to the chimney and the sneaky way down into the kitchens. And if they were paying attention to all that history that you dropped on them, they'll know that there is another point of entry somewhere that the orcs used to get around this place's defenses originally. That is at sea on the other side of the pinnacle, though. If they search around this entire mountain, or maybe if they climb up to the top and have a good perception check. It's no secret I love a good map, and this topographical one is pretty cool for a dungeon master. I also like this image of the stone tooth from the original version. It's evocative, and showing it to the players puts the clue of the smoking chimney in front of them. We get a little block talking about using random encounters for hills or forests if the players are smart enough to camp out and do a little reconnaissance, maybe even after a failed attempt trying to enter the mountain door a first time. So I'm going to take this opportunity to remind you I've got some pretty sweet encounter tables up on the Dungeon Masters Guild for forests and hills, as well as a few tier one adventures you could use to level up your PCs and point them at the Forge of Fury, and everything is available for free in the preview. Check out the playlist here for those. Up next, we are going to prepare to run the mountain door. Spoiler alert, I freaking love this section, so I hope I see you there. Until then, get out there, have fun, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time. Bye.